Welcome back to Rethinking Politics, episode 18. Today we're going to be discussing an idea that fits in to all of the things really that are happening right now. It ties into the election, it ties into the Supreme Court, which is in the news all the time right now. It ties into what we discussed last time with voting. And it's a big picture issue. It's the kind of thing that you should always have in the back of your mind when you're thinking about the problems in the United States government. When you're looking at the issues, this should be something that you consider how it might be influencing things or how things might be different with this with this in mind. So right now, the Senate is discussing whether to confirm Amy Coney Barrett as the next Supreme Court justice. We could get into that debate and talk to you about the points that are being made for and against her. And we concluded that it would not be worth your time. It would be a complete waste of your time and our time. (laughs) You're welcome. You are welcome. Because it's, uh, every time I keep trying to find, you know, something interesting that's happening that we could talk to you about, something that would tie in and be useful for you to, and for us to rethink a little bit. And this just isn't one of them. They're making, they're trying to label her as certain things or protect her from being labeled as certain things. It's more mudslinging, right? It's mudslinging and it's, and it's to try, the goal is to try and sway a few Senate votes. And if you can't sway a few Senate votes, which it looks like isn't going to happen, she's probably going to be confirmed. If you can't sway any votes there, what you can do is you can try and say the right things so that people will vote for you. Yeah, it's an opportunity for political grandstanding. It is, it is. That, that is what's going on yeah, right now, and it's just not worth your time. So each senator gets to spend a few minutes asking her questions and saying the kind of things they think will help them get reelected or will help sway votes towards Biden or Trump. And it's just, it just isn't worth your time. Find, <laughs> find something else to do. <laughs> Especially since we have literally no say over whether she gets in or not, right? Whether she gets in or not is completely out of our power. It's the Senate will decide, and that's that's that. What how you feel about her doesn't affect her lifetime appointment. <laughs> it just it just doesn't. <laughs> and if that makes you uncomfortable, please go back and listen to our Supreme Court episode. <laughs> please do. Which we discussed at length in fifteen. And when we were discussing that at the Supreme Court, one of the things we what we kept thinking about is as we were looking at the Supreme Court and what it does was just how odd it is in the grander scheme. When you look at historically how the Supreme Court has developed, the kind of power they're exercising now and how legislative it is in its nature and all of those those bigger issues of balance of power between the legislature, the Supreme Court, the federal uh, the uh, excuse me, the executive branch and the agencies of the federal government and how how that works and where where the decisions are made. And we left a piece, a really critical piece of that picture out. At least a piece that was critical and is still important today and perhaps provides an answer to that problem, or at least an important step in the answer to addressing the problems we discussed there. Then last episode is we discussed the voting and what, how you could vote and how your vote affects things and the role of parties in, in trying to win elections and how they look at votes. And we talked about structural changes to voting, proportional representation and the ranked voting. And all of that will make a difference. But again, there's another piece to it. And it's the piece that we're going to put into play today. And so this, where this comes together with all these issues, we felt like we had to talk about it and it's, and it will be relevant to the election. And so with that, we're going to introduce you to federalism and talk some history. In order to understand fully, well, understand fully is a stretch. We don't understand anything fully. So, but in order to, (laughs) in order to understand better this idea of federalism, we're going to to go back in time like we like we enjoy doing and get some historical perspective. Currently, our government system is a national system, not a federal system. And so what that means is that the majority of the power, the sovereignty of the nation lies in the federal government. And please bear with us as as we talk terminology in this episode because it does get confusing. You know, federalism and nationalism are two competing political ideas. Then you have the national government and the federal government, and those are just two different synonyms for the same thing. Right. (laughs) 
Yeah, so it, it, that that's going to be slightly confusing, and we're probably going to bounce back and forth of them just because that's how people use it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so if we say federal government or national government, we're talking about the same we're thing. Talking about the same thing. So currently, how it works is the majority of the power is in the federal or national government. The states are auxiliaries. They are governing bodies that are subsidiary to the federal government, and they have control in their own area. But at any point, the federal government can supersede them, and very often they do. On top of that, the state budgets themselves are actually dependent upon the federal government. Federal funding actually makes up a significant portion of every single state's budget. There's not a single state that doesn't have at least some federal funding. And that federal funding percentage varies. Um, Dan did some research. It, it, the The lowest state is North Dakota with its 18%. Is that right, Dan? That's right, 18%. 18% of their budget is from the federal government. And then you've got the high, which is 42% in Mississippi. Right. So somewhere between 20 and 40% of every single state's budget is paid for from federal coffers. So what that means is that without the federal government, these states cannot function. You know, if you lost 30% of your income, most people could not continue to function. They'd have to make some drastic changes. Yeah. And it's not like the states are saving money either. Like individuals may be saving some money. States are not. They're always spending all of that. Everything with, they have. With, yeah. with very few exceptions. There's not surpluses in state governments. Very few exceptions. There are a few, but very few. And along with that, that funding comes strings attached because the federal government, it says this is our money and here's how we need you to spend it. You know, you need to fulfill this requirement of this program, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And so, so all of this paints a picture of a system where the state has very little say. The state, as we talked about before, has a lot of power within their sphere. The thing is, and the most important fact that's different between nationalism and federalism is that the state's sphere of influence is only there because the federal government allows it. At any point, the federal government can shrink that sphere. And over the years, it has continually mm -hmm. decreased the size of that sphere. Over the years, our states are doing less and less. How much power our states have is significantly less now than it was 10 years or 20 years or 40 years ago mm -hmm. or 100 years ago. That has continually gone down. Yeah. And so it's changed from what it used to be. Yeah. And the Supreme Court plays a role in that, right? There are cases uh, where occasionally the Supreme Court's like, no, you can't make the states do that. But as a general trend, it's less and less over the years. And to the point where now really the federal government can do more or less whatever it wanted to and simply supersede the states. And most people understand that this is, this is the current system. Most people get that. What a lot of people don't understand is that this was not how it always was, that there used to be something different. And in order to understand federalism, we need to understand what it used to be. So let's cut back to before our country was founded, to the 1700s, and you've got these 13 colonies in the United States. And these 13 colonies obviously were colonies of the British government, which meant they were under the British government, much as the states are under the federal government now. But even then, things were unique because Britain was so far away, these colonies had an incredibly large amount of control over themselves. And because of that large amount of control and lack of supervision from the British government, these colonies had to figure out how to govern themselves from the very beginning. Yeah. You see a few like very, very early moments, Jamestown, right, comes to mind, where England, Great Britain was was exercising tight control on it. And what they're looking for is, if we send groups over to these places, right, they're going to turn a quick profit. It's a good, this is a money making scheme, we're going to go over there, we're going to set up a, a base, and we're going to, we're going to come back with money very quickly, and it's going to be profitable. It turns out, that's not how colonialism works in terms of going and making colonies like that and building up a society, basically. <laughs> it's, it is not a uh, profitable venture in the short term at all. Yeah, and, and that lack of uh, short-term profits 
definitely made the British government lose interest in these American colonies and largely let them do whatever they want in terms of self-government. As long as the colonies took care of themselves and were able to turn a modest profit, you know, in order to pay back those companies who had invested, the British government wasn't very concerned. Fast forward to after the American Revolution and before the creation of the Constitution, and you, what you have is a bunch of states operating under the Articles of Confederation. Now, in order to understand this, you need to understand, first of all, what we mean by state. And state, the definition in the United States, has shifted. Now, what's crazy is, is that if you look up the definition of state right now, you don't need to find an old-timey dictionary in order <laughs> to get the definition I'm looking for. If you look up state definition on Google, here's what it will say. Number two, a nation or territory considered as an organized political community under one government, a.k.a. The word state is a synonym for the word nation. And and when these colonies became states, that is exactly what happened. When we had 13 states under the Articles of Confederation, what we had was 13 completely independent nations who decided to work together to overthrow the British government and then to have an alliance through the Articles of Confederation in order to, to prosper. That was the idea. And it worked for the most part. It really did. There were a few issues where it didn't work. The primary issue was in terms of national defense. During the American Revolution, there was an American army that was working to defeat Britain. There weren't 13 separate armies. There was one army that these colonies, who were now states, had unified in order to overthrow Britain. And so they had to work together, and they did not work together very efficiently. You know, the Articles Confederation said that the Congress could ask the states for money, and that was it. And if the states gave them money, they would have the money, and if they didn't, they wouldn't. And George Washington and his army struggled because of that. They were incredibly underfunded, they were incredibly undermanned, and there was limited organization. And that made things very difficult. Then after the war, in order to negotiate with these other countries, they needed a little bit more teeth. And they didn't have those teeth, and they were almost negotiating as separate countries. Well, they were negotiating as separate countries with these other countries, and they felt that it could be more effectively done if they unified even further. And of course, this brings us to the, to the famous Constitutional Convention and the creation of the United States Constitution. You said that it was the Articles of Confederation were functional enough, even though uh, there were some problems with them. A lot of historians talk about the, the Articles of Convention, and some of the founders talk about the Articles of Confederation, excuse me, of Convention, Articles of Confederation, <laughs> as, if they, a f as if they didn't work at all. And, and that's untrue. That's, that is just blatantly untrue. And, and, the, and the evidence is very clear. We fought a war and won. Like we did everything that needed <laughs> everything that needed to happen happened. Now it was messy. It was terrible. Yeah, and there's no argument that it couldn't that it could have been done better. It, right. I mean, there's no argument that it couldn't have been done better. It definitely definitely could have been, have been, done, been better. done better. It definitely could have been done better. But the Articles of Confederation get a worse rap than they deserve because it actually worked. <laughs> it didn't work well, maybe, and it didn't in a lot of spheres. It had problems. But, uh, but it's hard to argue with the fact that the colonies were united enough under the Articles of Confederation to fight and win a war. And that's, that's not nothing when it's against one of the, the biggest superpower in the world at the time. Which brings us to the Constitutional Convention, where they throw out the Articles of Confederation and create a new system of government. Now, what's important to understand, and what I think a lot of people forget, is that the Constitution that was created in many ways, was not that different from the Articles of Confederation. Now, it had a few primary differences. Number one, it created an executive branch that had very strong wartime powers. 
and that was primarily because of the American Revolution, that they understood the need for these powers. The other thing it did is it did give the Congress, the President, and the Supreme Court limited powers over the states. Now, those powers were very limited. People talk about interstate commerce. That's an example of a very limited power that Congress was given to regulate commerce between the states. And the reason they did that was because, as we talked about before, one of the primary purposes of this new constitution, besides wartime powers, was to change how the states traded with each other and with other nations. And these ideas were based off of what is called mercantilism. Mercantilism was an, a financial idea that actually originated around this time period and is the idea that that states, and by states I of course mean nations, benefit from trading with other nations and that they benefit the most when they export more than they import. Now, you may recognize that idea because that's the exact same idea that Trump has in his trade policy. And the idea behind this mercantilism is that, is that the more money you had, the wealthier you are. And as a nation, the more hard currency you can get, the better off you're going to get. So the reason they wanted to, to regulate trade was in order to have a unified front when they traded with other nations. Rather than having South Carolina competing with Massachusetts when it comes to exports and imports and therefore undercutting each other in terms of, of levies and tariffs, in other words, taxes that were going to be laid on those exports and imports, and Britain as a unified country is able to manipulate those two states against each other in order to get the best prices, the United States as a united group of nations is able to say, no, these are, our, these are our tariffs and this is how it's going to be, and therefore get a more favorable trade negotiation with these countries. And regardless of how you feel about mercantilism, that explanation should make sense. That this is, they were simply trying to have a more for favorable trade agreement with these other nations. In addition to allowing free trade between the states. And that was something that the Constitution was able to do, along with a few other minor details in order to allow for a more effective alliance between these countries. The important thing, though, was that in this Constitution, these states were still states. It was the United States. Exactly. It was, you, you could think of it as the United Nations. That's what it, that's what it, that's how they meant it. It's funny when you look at like places like Canada that have provinces, right? And uh, other places that have, uh, they have districts or counties or larger, you know, large groups that are sub of at a, some form of subsidiary between the level of city and state and, or city and, <laughs> city and the federal government, the national government. And uh, none of them call them states because it doesn't make any sense. And it only makes sense in the United States if you're making a claim that they are sovereign in some sense. Yeah, that if you look at a province in Canada or an area in another country, none of those have the same power that the states did in the United States. In fact, to this day, states in the United States have significantly more power than any other administrative area in any other country, as far as I know. Yeah, as far as there I may know. be yeah. a, a tiny exception somewhere, but in, in terms of the the significant, the large and prosperous nations, ours is unique. What's unique about it is that the states in their spheres are not just the equal of the federal government, it's they are superior, right? There's initially, there were areas of the law where if the federal government tried to step in, the states would tell them to get lost. That's their territory. Yeah, and, and what federalism was under the U.S. Constitution was basically a system of dual sovereignty. And sovereignty basically means supreme, the supreme power. And so what you created was a system where within the borders of a state, and by state, please remember I mean nation. I, I feel like I need to hammer that a lot. That within the border of this nation, this nation of Massachusetts, this nation of North Carolina, this nation of Virginia, that state government was supreme. 
And then in these few areas that had to do with things outside of that state, like trade, like providing for the defense of these United States, there was the supreme authority within the federal government. And that was a very unique idea and a very unusual idea. And it had a lot of, uh, a lot of advantages. It does. And you can see how it would come out of something like the, uh, the Articles of Confederation. Because the Articles of Confederation, at the end of the day, because they had no tax collecting mechanism, no way to enforce uh, the gathering of money or to, uh, you know, no teeth as we, as we tend to express it. This is just an alliance with teeth in some sense. Yeah, it was not a government. It was an alliance. It's an al- it's and that's the way to think of it. It's it's a unit it's the United States and it's a re- it represents the states in a unified capacity. That's a concept that uh that well, you can see why many people are not aware of that or why that that is kind of counterintuitive. The idea that this the United States is not the supreme law of the land Always, it's the supreme law of the land within the terms of the Constitution, which establishes narrow ranges of power. Mm -hmm. And as Brad said, that are external in pretty much every single case to the states, which leaves the states sovereign within their borders on almost every issue. And if you were to go back in time and say, what are the, what, what issues are we discussing at the federal government right now that would have been states' issues? It'd be almost all of them. <laughs> yeah. Be yeah. Maybe almost even all of the them. issues. Maybe even all of them, with the exception of foreign policy and a few others. All of them. Yeah. All of, all of the issues that all these bureaucracies handle, all of the issues that, that, that we discuss in terms of elections and all of these things would be handled just on the state level, which is completely different from what we have today. You know, another example of what's different is that initially the Senate was not supposed to be a body that represented the people, it was a body that represented the states. That's why each state got the same number of senators. A lot of people say, hey, it makes no sense for there to only be two senators per state. It's because it wasn't about a democracy. It was about each state having a vote in this process as a state, yeah, not as an administrative body, not as a group of people, but as a nation. Yeah, they're not representing citizens of the United States, they're representing their sovereign state and its Which is why the Senate members were not elected, but were chosen by the state governments. Some state governments chose to do it differently than other state governments, but the point was that it was the state government's choice. Yes. In many cases, the state legislature would do it directly because they- And that was the most common. Right. And they knew, and it makes sense, they knew the interests of the state- and so for them to select representatives of their state to this national group, to this, uh, to this federal level, uh, makes a lot of sense. And that, that really sets up the Senate and the House of Representatives to be extremely different bodies. <laughs> if you look Which at, is how they were originally. Right. If you look at how they are now, you've got just, they're just elected from a broader area which sometimes makes them align differently and their election years are uh they're elected for a longer term which means that they they don't overlap nicely with the elections of the house so flipping one you may not flip the other and uh it it creates some some distinctions between them mostly the variation is between how many are blue and how many are red Yes. Because of the population makeup and not because of anything else. Yes. Yeah, precisely. It's it's like the electoral college where it's not some major change except that it's just a, another way to manipulate the numbers of reds versus blues. Yep. Which is what so much of this process has become. <laughs> that's what all of politics is at this point in, in some ways. You know, that's, the, that's what we're missing is the grandstanding right now. <laughs> that's what we're not talking about. <laughs> so – so now we want to talk about what what changed, because obviously that system that we've described is not what we have now. What we have now is a nation with administrative bodies. We have a Senate that's representative, and we have states that only have power that the federal government allows them to have. So obviously something changed, and... And there were, there were a lot of subtle changes over time, but the one thing, the one event that really changed everything was the Civil War. 
that was the tipping point and the turning point in the basic balance of power. Because after the Civil War, the states still had a lot of power, but they had lost their sovereignty. And once they lost their sovereignty, their independence, their supremacy within their state, then it was only a matter of time for them to lose more and more of those powers. And that's something that we've seen even to this day, you know, 150 plus years after the Civil War, that they're still losing more and more powers and will continue to do so until they truly become merely administrative levels unless something changes. So why did the Civil War change things? Everyone's familiar with the Civil War, but they don't really think of it between in these terms in the balance of power between state and federal level and the implications it'll have. Historically, the Civil War has described as a war about slavery and ending slavery. And that was definitely a part of it. And, and a very important result of the Civil War was the 13th Amendment. There's absolutely no questioning that. But that's not how it started. The Civil War started as an issue of states' rights, as an issue of federalism. And what was happening was the federal government, and more particularly the northern states, were trying to control trade in such a way that was detrimental to the South. And we could spend a lot of time talking about this, and I don't want to get too deep into it. But suffice it to say that the current makeup of the federal government, as soon as Abraham Lincoln became elected, was such that the Southern states felt like they were no longer represented by the federal government. And here's and here's where it all connects, is that the, the Southern states economies were completely different from the northern states because of slavery. It absolutely was because of slavery that their economic system was completely different. And because their economic system was completely different, the things they wanted, the things that were beneficial to them in terms of trade and these regulations was completely different from what was beneficial to the north. And so once the north gained control of the federal government, the southern states felt like they were no longer represented and no longer beneficial for them to be in this federal government because this federal government now had the power to oppress them, right? Economically. And so they exercised what they believed to be their right as sovereign states to secede. And that is, I think, the ultimate trump card that states had. And that's something that states had had threatened to do on numerous occasions before the Civil War. And this was just the first time that they actually carried it out. And numerous occasions after. I was going to say every every national election, <laughs> a state considers it, right? And people in a state talk about it. But that was the only time that it's happened. And they secede, and the federal government crushes the living heck out of them. And that once and for all solidified the fact that the states did not have the power, that it was the federal government that had the power. And ever since then, things have never been the same. And, and it's important to understand that that's a separate issue from the one of slavery. That although both these things happen in the same time frame, they're two separate issues. And even though, you know, I for one am super glad that the 13th Amendment happened and that there was, that, that the slaves were freed doesn't mean that I have to be happy with these other side effects of this event. That the Civil War, multiple things happen in the Civil War, and, and some of them are good and some of them are, are bad. And that's the reality of life, is that everything is not always so clear-cut one way or the other. Yeah, it's not always cut and dried. Uh, the way that people frame federalism today, the most common way I hear it portrayed is through the slavery story, as you just described it. People will often see the big actions that the federal government takes, the laws they pass, things like the, the 13th Amendment, things like uh, the Civil Rights Act later, things, these other pieces. And they see these big things that the federal government does, and they see it as battling backwards ideas in states so what really killed federalism there is not necessarily that any laws changed or any institutions changed. Yeah, it wasn't because of a constitutional amendment that shifted the balance of power. It was 
what was understood. Mm -hmm. It's the perception of the people. Yeah. And that's what changed because previous to that, and this is something that's so hard to grasp when you're discussing this with with people because because it's not about the words in the Constitution. It's not even about about the laws that were passed. It's about the understanding that people had. And before the Civil War, people understood that when push comes to shove, the states were nations and were therefore sovereign, and that the federal government could could be sovereign in these certain areas, but outside of those areas, they weren't sovereign, and that when push comes to shove, if a state wanted to, they could leave the system because they were a nation. Just like a, how a nation can leave an alliance, one of these states could leave the federal government. And as soon as it was proven that they could not, it shifted that balance in people's minds. People understood now that if the, a state didn't like what was happening, tough. There's now no longer anything they can do about it. Yeah, and that really shifts the culture and how people act in regards to states and, and with reference to those things. Now, the states still exercised basically sovereign power in several spheres. But if at the end of the day, that sovereign power is something that is allowed to you, it's no longer it's sovereign. It's no longer sovereign in the same way. It's no longer sovereign in the same way. So, <clears throat> and, and it makes perfect sense then that there becomes, that this becomes kind of the beginning and the key moment that then leads to a long slide of decreases in state power and more and more reliance on the federal government for decisions. And how this has been painted historically is is very simple and it started with the civil war but has continued since then you know the civil war is painted as a simply one-dimensional story it was a fight to free the slaves and the slaves were freed then you've got other stories you've got stories like the civil rights movement women's rights gay marriage discrimination all these huge issues that the federal government has has swooped in like like a hero of old to save the people of the United States from these backward states with their, you know, with with racism and discrimination and all of these things that have gotten in the way of progress. And that's how it has been painted historically. And when you look at it that way, it's a no-brainer. You say, okay, well, we need this 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 federal government. We need it to be a national government, a national system, not a federal system, so that the federal government can counter the evil of the states. And that's why federalism doesn't work. And that's why all these changes had to be made. That if it weren't for slavery, we wouldn't have needed the Civil War, but the states couldn't be good on their own and they had to be forced into it. The problem is, is that that picture that is painted is inaccurate. It's missing key details. And understanding those details is key to understanding why federalism is a viable option. Let's start with slavery, because that one's very easy to talk about, because obviously slavery is horrible. You know, you're hard-pressed to find a pro-slavery candidate in the United States today for good reason. <laughs> but the argument that it was only the states who were pro-slavery and that it was only the national government who was able to change it is inaccurate. From the very beginning with the United States Constitution, the federal government was a protector of slavery. The Constitution itself had clauses that protected the state's rights to own slaves. That was in place from the beginning. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of slavery on multiple occasions, and those protections put serious stops on those abolitionists in the North who wanted to do something about slavery. They were checked again and again and again by the federal government. That happened. That's real. And so, so your argument that slavery needed to be stopped, I agree with completely. I think everyone agrees with that. The problem is, is that people believe there's only one way it could have been stopped. And that's with the Civil War. And the reality is, is we'll never know because the federal government 
stopped any other avenue from being attempted. And that's just the reality. And and you have to you have to consider that. You know, if you want to look at the the civil rights movement, people look at the Civil Rights Act and say this is what fixed it. This is what fixed these issues. Which of course sounds crazy now as everyone's talking about how they weren't <laughs> fixed, but we're not even going to address that. But well actually that is worth addressing. The fact that that a federal mandate doesn't solve all issues. And that the issues that were fixed during the civil rights movement, (laughs) here's the best way of putting it. Those events, things like the Civil Rights Act, were believed to be the key events that changed the world, really. But in reality, those events were actually the symptoms of the change that had already happened. The Montgomery bus boycotts effected change in Montgomery. The laws were changed immediately, well, immediately in terms of, you know, within within a year or two, things started happening. In other areas, things started happening. People started to change their beliefs and ideas, and then the federal government had acted. The assumption is that the federal government had to act, and there's just not evidence for that. There's really not. It's simply the fact that by... By the 1960s and 70s, the federal government, by that point, had become the main instrument of change. But they didn't have to be. Right. They did not have to be. Right. It's it's a strange thing because it, this is this probably is counterintuitive, but it seems like everyone absorbs this this idea, and it, maybe it's from history. I'm not sure where it comes from culturally. The idea is something like this: the way to shape the world is through government action. And the government comes in and it acts in a way and then the world changes because of it. And so if you want to change the world, it must go through the government, right? But the process required to get the support of the government widespread enough to make a legal change, a significant legal change against significant opposition, requires changing the world. Yeah. And so you've actually done, by the time you get to the point where that that law can pass, you already won. And that law ends up being kind of a rubber stamp, a rubber stamp, at, stamp the end. at the end because you've shifted the culture. And the problem was not that the police aren't smacking enough people who are being racist, right? The problem is that there are people <laughs> who are being racist. That's the heart of the problem. And and so you have to find a way to address address it at a personal level. It's this weird – it's this weird thing where you read a history book, right? And it talks about the law, the president did this, the, the, the legislature did that, the laws came down, the nations fought in this way, and this is how the nations interacted. And it zoomed out so far that you only see these big scale things. And the problem is that that's not where the action is. And that's not where change happens. It really isn't. There's a Leo Tolstoy devoted in his greatest work, War and Peace, is in part addressing this problem with with how we think of history and how people write history. <laughs> and he talks about Napoleon Bonaparte and, and all these major events that were happening in Russia and, and in France at the time. And then he says, meanwhile, the normal people's lives went on as normal. And they had their, you know, the things that were important <laughs> to them and the things that mattered. And, and there's these two different levels you can look at events. And one of them, it's this grand scale where you feel like this is how the world changes. And then there's the one where the world never really changes. It's the day-to-day actions of the individual. But that is actually where the power is. That is actually where the events that that matter happen. It's in the day-to-day interactions. It's in the the conversations you have with friends. And if you start to look too much at the grand scale, you get really mixed up ideas about what is causing what. Because those are final steps. Those are not the first mm-hmm. steps that cause mm-hmm. the change. Those are final steps after major changes have been made. And you've got to figure out, and if you want to make a change, you got to think of it that way. you got to say, what is the first step from here that's going to end or at least culminate in these kind of actions at a broad legislative level? You know, it's, a, it's a very different way of perceiving the world and what causes large-scale change. That was very well put. And as you said, to to think of it as if the government has come in as a hero out of nowhere and it's done, you know, the act is done and the world is shaped forever after. 
is to really misunderstand the events that le that led up to it that are actually the really important pieces. And you look at what's happening today in, in politics and you see these two parties with these diametrically opposed views, at least in certain areas, and they're both trying to get control of this one government and force their will on the other side. I mean, that's really what their goal is on both sides, is they're trying to force their will on the other side to get their ideas through and use the, the national government to force everyone to conform to what they think is right. You know, both sides think they're right, mm -hmm. and they're willing to use the force of the government to create that change when, in reality, if you actually want to create change, you're much better off using states and local governments, and more importantly, as Dan said, the people within those states and local governments who are actually going to affect change. You know, if you want to talk about a talk about progress, the most effective tool of progress is persuasion. You know, you look at at the current Black Lives Matter movement and and race relations and all of that that's been brought up this year, that didn't happen because the national government said, this is what we're going to talk about as a nation. That happened because there were a few isolated incidents that people shared, people cared about, and people talked about. And because of people caring and seeing and talking, changes have started to happen. And not changes on a national level, but on a local level. There are tons of and tons of police departments that are changing their policies, that are changing their practices, and that is going to make a very real difference. You may argue that it's not enough, and I, I may agree with you, but the fact is, is that real change is happening, and that change is happening not on a national level, but on a local level. And that's real power. And that is real power, and we do not need the national government to make that change. And guess what? After these changes are going to be made, the national government is going to pass some all-encompassing <laughs> omnibus bill that will cure all racism. And they're going to put their stamp on it and say, we did this. <laughs> and you know what? They didn't. And, and that's what's happened in history is we look back and we see that big rubber stamp and we say, yep, the national government did it. And that's just not true. Yeah. And it's so important that we understand that. Yeah. There's a, there's a sphere in which this is true that, uh, that most people wouldn't expect. And it's the sphere of regulation. That most regulations are passed after almost every company has shifted to doing that already. And it ends up being a rubber stamping that looking back makes it seem like they're advancing society in significant ways. And, uh, it's just. And. And here's the clincher, because you may be thinking, well, then what's wrong with this system? The problem is, is that when the federal government pr passes that omnibus all-encompassing legislation, it's going to have a whole bunch of unintended consequences that are going to make things worse for people in ways that they did not expect or see, because you can't pass legislation like that without it having ramifications. As Dan said... You'll have most businesses already conforming to a certain regulation, and yet the national government will pass regulation that is too all-encompassing for these 300 million plus people and is going to have a whole bunch of nasty side effects because it is simply too large. The, the, our nation, our nation, which is what it is now, it's not a conglomeration of nations, it's one nation. Our nation is too large for legislators in dc to be able to think of all the different situations there it's simply impossible yeah it's simply impossible it really is it really is and it, and it it ends up freezing you in time and saying this is this is what we know now we're going to apply it when we're going to know more tomorrow and we're going to find better ways to do this tomorrow and we're going to find you know as as technology shifts in significant ways all the time and and these regulations are essentially immortal so having addressed the straw man historical reading of federalism as the enemy of progress, which the federal government has saved us from by <laughs> intervening <laughs> on our, you know, on our, on behalf of the, the, uh, crushed minorities or whatever it may be. 
I want to make the positive case for federalism that Brad was starting to make there. We live in a world right now where people are at each other's throats. The good news is that because of state governments, you can actually impose most of what you want done at the state level. Even to this day? Even to this day, you could impose, you could have a state that fully embraces embraces socialism if they wanted to. And that would be fine. Instead, everyone feels like any change to health care should be at the federal level. Any change to any system should be at the federal level. When the states have massive power still over a lot of these spheres. Police reform is another good example. Police reform, you can do all kinds of things with police at the state level. And by channeling all these through the national level, where you have two sides that really despise each other, you create, we are quickly moving towards a society where there is actually, where there already is violence on the streets and where there may be more in the future. Federalism is a system that allows people to interact with those of opposing views on a much more personal level, which allows them, instead of becoming more and more antagonistic, to actually work together. And if you go to your local and state governments, you will see that. You will see Republicans and Democrats communicating and and compromising and working together in ways that you wouldn't believe possible <laughs> when looking Given at the national, national scale. Yeah. Yeah. Because because they're so much closer together on what they want on the state level. When they look at the roads that need to be built, when they look at at the people who need to be taken care of and and the 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 dangers they need to be protected against they tend to agree a lot more than they disagree yeah. and are actually able to get some things done. Yeah, and, the, and it makes sense that the smaller and more closely united the group, the more they're going to have in common and the more they're going to be able to decide and work on things together. And that the larger and more diverse the group, the less they're going to be able to do that. I have as little in common with many of the people who live in New York as many of the people who live in England, as many of the people who live in China. As many of the people who <laughs> no, I have, which is basically nothing. <laughs> so it makes so much more sense for those people living in New York to decide how they would like to live. And for you, Dan, in Texas, to decide. To not be bound by their decisions. <laughs> yeah, to, exactly. To be bound by, by your decisions here in Texas and not by the pe- those of the people in New York. Yeah. It simply makes more sense for there to be a separation. And you can think in terms of negotiation and partisanship, that will obviously be better. There's another way in which it's better. The closer you are to a problem, the easier it is to see it. We don't need a national law to clean up my backyard. (laughs) What would make the most sense would be for me to clean it up or for me and my family to clean it up, right? But if the problem gets to the community level, you know, maybe the neighborhood, then the neighborhood should be involved, maybe. And if it gets to a city level, maybe the city should get involved, right? And the the idea that you should address problems at the smallest possible level is a principle of efficiency. It makes sense. It's the people that are affected by it who should be solving it. It's the people who are most concerned and interested and informed about it who should be addressing the problem. What do I know about California forest fires? A bizarre amount, actually, given the <laughs> much more than you'd think I should, much more than I will ever need to know, right? <laughs> but how much does it affect me personally? Not very little, but the people there know a lot about it, presumably, or could, and are affected by it, and have much more interest in knowing about it, and can address it. And that no, and that's and that's a great example just right there is is you could say there are certain things that the government of California should do to prevent forest fires. Are those things the same as what they should do in North Dakota to prevent forest fires or Texas to prevent forest fires or Maine to prevent forest fires or Hawaii to prevent forest fires? (laughs) So if the national government comes out with their forest management plan and forces all the states to behave the exact same way in terms of forest management, 
it makes absolutely no sense. What makes far more sense is for each state and often even a smaller area, but at least to the state level, allow people to self-regulate, to have laws that make sense for their area that don't make sense for other areas. It's that simple. At the closer level, you can be more adaptable. As Brad was saying, it's, it just, it, and it makes sense that you can have particular solutions to particular problems instead of having a general solution a one to size fits particular all. problems. And that's, that's not even, I don't think that's a controversial thought at all. It makes perfect sense. Now, there are big moral issues where it's harder to see, right? Forest management makes perfect sense. Economic, uh, a lot of the economy planning, those kind of things where people are considering uh, taxes and, and social welfare and benefits and those kind of things. That, uh, that makes healthcare, those kind of issues all make sense at a, the smallest possible level. There are a few areas where it's a little grayer, right? Where it's, where the case is a little bit harder and it's the big moral cases. It's slavery. It's abortion. These cases, it's not enough to handle them effectively, right? That's not what people are concerned about. <laughs> it's not a, it's not, are we too partisan? It's a, it's a high moral stance on these things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the fact that it exists anywhere in the world whether it be uh, slavery exists anywhere in the world is enough to make you want to do something about it whether it affects you directly or not and that is often the response against federalism and at first it makes a lot of sense just like we talked about before with the civil war and slavery at first it makes a lot of sense that what we should do is use the national government to impose our will because we know we're right mm -hmm. On this important moral issue, we know we're right and the other side is wrong. And to let them continue would be evil. You know, this is a question of good and evil. Yeah, exactly. And so, so therefore, we must we must fight for everything. You know, both sides are fighting for the entire pie, and only one side can have the entire pie. And even when that side has the entire pie, they're terrified that any minute they could lose the entire pot and have nothing <laughs> once again. When in reality, the more effective thing to do, especially if you know you're right, and this is a universal principle, is that forcing people to do something they don't agree with is never a long-term solution. You can do it in the short term with, with force, with violence, with force of law, whatever it is, you can do it in the short run, but in the long run, it's never going to be effective. And if you actually want to affect real change, it's going to be through the power of persuasion. You're going to have to change people's minds, and you're not going to be able to do that on the national level. Just take a look. It hasn't happened. It's not yeah. going to happen. And so if you want, so using the national government as a giant bat to beat the other side into submission is simply a terrible strategy regardless of whether or not you think it's the right strategy it's not working and it's going to continue to not work but if you'd like to actually make make change look on the smaller levels and look to persuade yeah and it, if you take it take another example so right now everyone agrees that theft is wrong right Theft is obviously something you shouldn't do. There are exceptions. There are people who don't think it's wrong, and there are people who think it's wrong, and they do it anyway. And we respond with force to that extremely small minority, right? And that works out well enough. We, we talked about things you could do to reform criminal justice, right, that we think would make it more effective. But if half of the country thought theft was okay and they were stealing, and the other half thought theft wasn't okay, the answer, one way or another, cannot be force. You can't force half the country to stop stealing. It's not possible. It's not even remotely possible. You couldn't stop 10% of the country. You probably couldn't stop 5% of the country. You may not even be able to stop 2% of the country. It, it's only because it's a tiny minority that criminal justice things work. And so with regards to abortion, wherever you are on that, the other side is far too big for a stick to work. Even if you won, even if you won, the enforcement of that law in, in, is just not going to happen. It's not going to be effective 
when such a huge portion of the population disagrees. It's, it's just not going to work. And that's that may make you uncomfortable. It should, because what you want is you want the other side to stop, whichever side you're on of that. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm extremely pro-life, I think is probably the right way to describe it. It's ext- mm-hmm. I, I'm extremely uncomfortable. I think, I think abortion is evil. That's not what we're saying here. We're not saying take so many people look at federalism saying, let the states decide as a moderate stance as being like, well, Everyone can decide for themselves. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is that federalism will allow society to continue while you get out there and persuade people because that is what has to happen. Nothing else will do. No amount of force will do. You have to get out there and you have to persuade people. And if you can't persuade people, no amount of force is going to stop it when there's such a massive... And no amount of nationalism is going to fix it. No amount of nationalism is going to fix it. There is a battle there to be won. And... The battle through the coercion of federal government is not the right sphere. It's not where that battle Absolutely. has to be won. Now, maybe one day, well maybe one day they will rubber stamp the success later, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, in the meantime, that is not how the battle needs to be fought. And to think of it as, as we have to get the federal government on our side of this issue is the wrong way to go about trying to win that fight. That isn't the problem. The problem fundamentally is that there are far too many people who disagree with you and you need to go and persuade them. You can't lock up all Absolutely. of them. You can't lock up 50% Absolutely. of the country. And so as we, as we push for this idea of federalism, in many ways what we're talking about is a cultural shift. Because as we talked about before, for the most part, it's not the laws that have shifted or the language of the Constitution. It's rather the ideas that people hold. And all you need to do in order to increase the effectiveness of, of the state is to pay attention to it. The more people pay attention to what state governments do, the more influence and power they're going to have. The less attention we pay to the national government the more power the state governments are going to have. We can start the shift going in the opposite direction without a single constitutional amendment. Yeah. Now, that being said, we talked about a constitutional convention and the changes that could be made. This is an example of of a, a fantastic area for change in that constitutional convention in a constitutional amendment that's proposed is codifying that shift of power back from the federal government into a system of federalism that gives that power to the states. Yeah. But in order for that to happen, there first has to be that cultural shift, and that's what we're pushing for. Because as we talked about before, first the people change, then the government does. And federalism will be one of the pieces that balances the government power again. The Senate taking its rightful place as a representative of the state's powers and of the state's goals would completely change the way the federal government works. It restores a missing piece. Now, you'll note that the way we've argued this, we're not, we're not arguing this that we need to return to the founding. That's not what we're saying at all. No, in fact, we're saying that we need to change how the Constitution's written. Right. Because because we think it can definitely be improved on. Right. But we are saying that that missing piece, that federalist piece, actually makes a difference and would be and is in many ways an answer to the partisanship we have today and the the, the serious imbalances and, and constitutional issues in terms of how the government actually functions in the federal government today is because of how much pressure is being put on the national government that should be going to other bodies and decisions that should be made at at lower levels that are instead being made at the highest levels for everybody. And if you got that back, if you would, if you had the states making these decisions and the Senate voting no on all kinds of things the federal government does because they're already doing it in the states, right? And they don't Mm -hmm. need the Mm -hmm. federal government to come in here and tell them how to run everything. That would make a huge difference. No, it would be a radical change that, as we explained here, would cut past the partisanship and allow for 
people to have representative government that best serves their interest, which I think is what everyone wants. And that's why federalism is so important. Yeah. And your vote matters so much more at the smaller levels of government. <laughs> you can you can actually make a difference to those. The national government, you have very Absolutely. little effect. And so to push it to lower levels is to give you more say over what matters. It's to give individual Bring people more power more back power. to the people. Yeah. In the long run, it restores a significant amount of power to the people to change things and to have an effect on the world that they live in. And and that's what we hope to do with federalism. And it's it's something that is a very realistic possibility. I know it can appear impossible, but it's really not. It's something that that is well within our grasp and well within the legal bounds of the system that we're in. And and it's just something that even if you're not convinced, keep it in the back of your minds as Dan said at the beginning of this episode, as a fundamental way of looking at the national government and ask yourself why this needs to be done on such a large scale and consider some of the alternatives. And with that, thank you for listening. 